Good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on where you're calling in from. My name is Beth Sanders, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Registrar's Committee Western Region. We are the regional affiliate of the Collection Stewardship Group of AAM, uh, representing the nine Western states. And we are so thrilled to be bringing you our seventh webinar in this hands-on practical conservation for the collections professional series. We've been able to highlight amazing conservators and we have another amazing one with us today in Gina Watkinson. And of course, there we go. Our sponsor for today's webinar is Cook's Crating. As one of the nation's oldest and most respected fine arts handlers and shipping, Cook's Crating and Fine Art Transportation is the company that many of America's greatest museums, galleries, and collectors turn to for their art moving needs. Based in Los Angeles, don't forget to contact Cook's Crating for your crating, shipping, installation, and storage needs. And a huge thank you to Cook's Crating for being a tier one sponsor of RCWR. If you are not a member of RCWR, please consider joining. Membership is only $15 a year. And as our regional affiliate of CSAAM, we not only are providing these awesome webinars all year, but we're looking forward to future in-person events as well. We send out a weekly job listing email and have a quarterly newsletter filled with great articles. And we have stipends available to apply for, for regional and national conferences. If you need more information about joining or to sign up today, you can go to rcwr.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, just a few Zoom logistics. We are recording today's webinar, so it will be available uh, within a few days on RCWR's YouTube page, as well as embedded into our webpage, the workshops link on, the, on rcwr.org. This is a webinar, so while you can see Gina and I, we can't see you. We're grateful to everyone saying hello in the chat function. Um, we also have the Q&A function enabled. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, we'll hold those till the end if there are questions for Gina about the content and we'll be able to ask her as many as time will allow at the end. Um, ah, hello, India. Once again, reminder to people who are putting a comment in the chat, if you have a comment throughout that's not a question for Gina, just to select that panelist and all attendees so you can get the most input on that. Our wonderful speaker today is Gina Watkinson. Gina is the Conservation Laboratory Manager at the Arizona State Museum, part of the University of Arizona, where she's worked since 2007. She received her BA from the University of Delaware Art Conservation Department in 2007 and went on for her MA in American Indian Studies with a graduate certificate in heritage conservation from the University of Arizona in 2013. She is currently a doctoral candidate in the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. Gina is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation and the co-chair for the ASC Archaeological Discussion Group. Thank you, Gina, for being willing to join us today and speaking about the skills involved in caring for our basketry collections. With that, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. okay. Well, I wanna first thank uh, both Beth and RCWR for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you about the care basketry, as it is one of my favorite types of materials and objects. And in fact, uh, my master's degree was focused on basketry. So, oops. So in 2011, uh, Arizona State Museum received a Save America's Treasures grant to renovate our space for our basketry and archeological perishable collections. Our collection consists of approximately 5,000 ethnographic baskets and 35,000 archeological fragments. And subsequent IMLS grants uh, assisted in funding the survey, treatment, and rehousing of our collection. If you wanna read more about the project, there are several articles that the lab has published related to the work. 
Um, and as you can see, our original collection, um, where our collection was stored on the left-hand side, wasn't a very good collection uh, storage area. And now we have a really wonderful place um, for people and artists to come view our basketry, um, as well as it being more safe for the collection. A lot of the solutions that we came up with dealing for such a complex collection came out of this project. And I hope that the information will also assist you in better taking care of your collection um, as well. So I thought I would briefly mention the types of basketry as understanding technology can give us some insight on potential weaknesses and strengths. Um, and so here are four uh, different techniques that we sort of classify baskets in. Um, so that's coiling, twining, wicker, and plating. And so I'm, this is going to be a pretty brief overview. You can, um, there's lots of different books that you can look uh, further into this. But coiling is a, is a sewing technique and is one of the easier techniques to identify as they have a spiral appearance. So the one in the top left. Uh, the foundation is wrapped with uh, the moving element to form the coil and the coils are secur secured in place by sewing. So twining, um, which is the top right, is um, two elements are woven at the same time around warps, sometimes called spokes, uh, which are the stationary elements. Um, wicker um, consists of a single weft element um, and the direction of the warp is vertical um, and the warp elements are typically larger and stiffer than the weft material. And plating, I also feel like this might be another uh, technique that's easy to identify. There is no distinct warp or weft elements. All of the elements are active and are usually the same size and made from the same material. And usually when I think of plating, I always think of kindergarten when they had you kind of make those mats <laughs> and that's sort of the same technique. It, it's also important to know about the wide array of materials that baskets can be composed of. Each type of material is going to interact with the environment a little bit differently. Um, basketry materials in general are made of plant parts or plant materials, and they can consist of things like roots, um, barks, stems, leaves, and pods. And in the Southwest, um, I can give you some examples of what I'm more familiar with. So Tona Autumn baskets sometimes use devil claws uh, as uh, some of the black elements in um, some of their coiling. And that those are actually uh, seed pods. Um, and then you have uh, some materials made out of roots. So again, in the Autumn, they use um, yucca root um, to make the red components. Um, we also have other embellishments or elements related to basketry material that are either attached or um, uh, maybe even completely made of those things. So feathers and quill uh, leather, uh, resin, dyes, hair, and even sometimes plastic can be involved. Um, and those are usually or considered organic materials. Um, and then you have inorganic materials. Uh, commonly, we see glass, metal, and other pigments, which are mineral-based. And so, as you can see, uh, even though normally we think of basketry materials as only composed of um, organic or basketry parts, it actually can have multiple um, different things in them. Actually, we're seeing more and more people doing um, more interesting or innovative um, types of basketry. And so I've seen complete plastic, uh, baskets made out of plastic. Um, the Autumn used to make or still do make um, wire baskets. And that's almost a completely, even though they're, they're considered basketry, it's the same technology. It's a completely different material and we would work with it a very different way than some of the things that I'm gonna talk to you about today. So just keep that in mind that you, even though something might be considered a basket, we might treat it a different way based on the materials. Uh, since this webinar is really geared for museum professionals, I thought I didn't need to cover some of the more basic things such as how to properly handle objects, but I did wanna cover collections uh, contaminated with pesticides and how to protect yourself or your employees or your researchers and tribal members um, from these materials, especially since basketry would have been um, an object commonly sprayed with these materials. As many of you probably are already aware of, um, museum collections made of organic materials may be contaminated with pesticides. 
It was common for museums to spray pesticides on museum collections to deter insects from damaging the collection. Even if your museum didn't practice this, you may still have collections that did uh, get fumigated or sprayed um, because the people that donated them to you may have done this practice. So um, if you think your collection or an object um, has pesticides, um, you don't want to handle um, these objects with your bare hands. And in general, I would say uh, when working with organic material, you should be wearing gloves. Um, so the things that you can wear are nitrile gloves, um, an apron or a lab coat, a particle mask are also advisable for protection if you're really concerned, if you think there's a lot of pesticide uh, on your object. And it is sort of odd right now, especially with COVID, that we're more and more used to wearing masks. <laughs> um, but you want to make sure you're using um, uh, an N95 or an N99. Um, so um, you also, if you believe that an object is contaminated with pesticides, you wanna make sure you're labeling those as well. And you wanna label the object, the storage enclosure that it's in, and maybe even the cabinet if you're really concerned. So we're really lucky here at the Arizona State Museum because we have a conservation lab and we're actually really well, our lab is known for the re, um, our research on pesticides because of Dr. Nancy Odegaard, who was head of this lab for over 30 years and now um, emeritus here. Um, and the way that we identify uh, pesticides is using analytical tools. And one of those tools is a portable XRF. Um, but we know that you actually, these these pieces of equipment are quite expensive and you need to have a good understanding of chemistry to be able to use them properly. And not only do we um, use these instruments, but when we are determining what, what type of, um, where it, the level of pesticides that can be harmful to humans, we're not health professionals. So we actually work with health professionals to help us make those decisions. Uh, but we are aware that most museums, most private collections, most people in general uh, will not have these instruments. Even some conservation labs won't have these instruments because they're uh, quite expensive. So um, one of the ways that you can begin to um, figure out whether your collection may have uh, pesticides are to look at some of the institutional records that your, um, your museum has or your institution has. And so some of the things that you could look for are old tags or labels or marks on the objects. So sometimes you'll actually see, you know, that something is poisoned. Um, and of course, that's like the best, uh, sort of your best, your, you hope that you have that, but it's not always the case. You might see residues on artifacts that might be an indicator of a pesticide or a persistent odor. So like, um, Naphthalene or um, mothballs are pretty stinky, so that might be an indication. You might have containers or bags that are used to dispense pesticide in your museum, so that's a good indication that may, perhaps your museum uh, did do these um, practices. Um, or maybe you have some old equipment, um, like a room. So there, some people used to have fumigation rooms, and so this, of course, would be a, um, an indication that you had pesticides in your collection. Um, or if you have old chemicals and, and just the pesticide containers. Um, and in our museum, we, they didn't uh, keep really good records, but in our archives, we actually had some information about purchasing. So maybe if you have old um, receipts for purchasing, that could be a good way to look for it. And even some of our catalog cards, um, handwritten notes will be, uh, will be on our um, on catalog cards about whether something was fumigated or whether it had um, chemicals on it. And you may not know exactly what chemicals they were applying, but um, it's still just very good to have an understanding whether your collections have pesticides. But if you don't know, um, it's just best to take um, best practices and best precautions and just wear gloves when you're handling uh, basketry materials. So um, clean, uh, surface cleaning is a non-water or non-solvent-based -solvent technique for reducing or removing surface deposits. Uh, cleaning, so you just want to know that cleaning is an irre irreversible process. You always want to use caution and take time to assess if vacuuming is really needed. 
um, you want to use common sense and you want to match the cleaning technique with the condition of the back basket. So if the basket appears clean after a light dusting, uh, you probably don't need to go any further with cleaning. Um, some, uh, we actually tell people not to um, add water um, to well, as, their, uh, as a, a cleaning technique. Some, some conservators um, have, might suggest this, but actually, we actually prefer people not doing this because adding moisture can cause lots of different issues like deformation. It can impact some dyes. Um, it can make it susceptible to mold. It can even dir uh, drive dirt deeper into the surface. Um, so it, uh, we don't uh, suggest people use moisture. And you don't, and finally, you don't want to remove indigenous repairs or cultural residues. So here are um, cultural residues might look different for each uh, type of um, like different materials. Um, and so they're sometimes a little hard to, um, to, to figure out, but Right here, here are two examples. On the left, there's a taro mara basket uh, strainer, and the little white deposits are not dirt or mold. They kind of look some. I remember when someone did bring this, they thought it was mold. It's actually uh, corn beer residue. Um, and on the right side, is another taro humara basket is actually an adhesive. And uh, the adhesive we, because uh, both of these are used as strainers. And the reason why we were able to identify this was through um, using an FTIR equipment. But if you ever see materials on a basket that looks suspicious, um, just make sure you do some further research to make sure you, you're not removing these residues because this is part of the object, it's part of its history. So we would never remove these um, and we would take special care to make sure that they stay on the basket as best as they can. Other things that you wouldn't want to um, remove are indigenous repairs or mends. And here are two really good examples of that. Um, you might see the, uh, that some baskets might be rewoven. Um, and so that might be an indication of an indigenous repair or historic repair that you wouldn't remove. Um, you also might see like on the right hand side, there's a piece of leather on the bottom of this. Um, and that's also uh, a native or an indigenous repair um, on this basket. And sometimes these are hard to, um, to tell the difference. So again, you should really do a lot of research before um, cleaning or making the assessment to remove a repair. Um, even There's even some instances here at our museum where um, maybe we see a repair on a piece of pottery or a basket that isn't a native repair, but actually uh, ends up being a, a, a non-native repair that's um, less about, which is more about its historic uh, or, or, so actually I have a really good example. We have this one pot that has a really unusual repair where they, the person who, um, owned it actually made a little cozy out of, uh, from uh, shoe um, laces. So they made a little cozy out of shoelaces and then put the pot inside of it. And it's adhered um, with a, a resin on the outside. And so normally we would take that off because it doesn't make any sense to the, to the object, but because it's part of its historic it's, uh, it's the object's history. We decided to keep it on because the person who repaired it um, has a lot to do with that collection. So even though they might not be indigenous, indigenous repairs, you may want to also keep them as well. So you need to have a discussion. So one of the ways you can do that is first work with your curators. Uh, we often forget, forget about the institutional knowledge that um, our own <laughs> colleagues have and the expertise of our colleagues. And um, also you wanna start so, to collaborate with your community members, your cultural leaders and your artists. Um, and some, uh, thankfully at the Arizona State Museum, we actually do have a board uh, of people that we work with regularly, as well as keeping uh, in contact with uh, native artists. Um, one, a really good resource is a SAR's guideline for collaboration if this is not something your museum already does. Um, and it has some really great examples of what people, um, what people have, have done with other, have worked with other native communities as, um, as well as um, just 
collaboration with artists as well. So um, really the question is when to vacuum. So before a newly ac acquisitioned object is brought into storage is a good reason to vacuum. Um, we don't know where the life of the object may be at that point. It might be uh, the object may have been left in the attic or maybe it was in a basement. Um, and so before an object comes into the collection, often we do um, vacuum it. This is also a really good time for us to assess some of the any damage that the object may have or whether it has insects. So anytime an object comes in, uh, we tend to do a light dusting. Another reason why you might want to vacuum is before and after an object goes on exhibit or on loan. Um, this is, uh, especially when you're bringing an object back from loan, um, if it was on display, uh, maybe the, the case that that object was in um, wasn't completely secured and, um, and dust got in there. So you wanna make sure you remove that before you put it back into the collection. Um, and also you might wanna vacuum to remove dead insects and frass. So if you ever see, um, a collection, uh, an object, a basket that has dead insects, of course, you want to remove that. And uh, doing a light dusting will help. So basketry uh, tends to trap dust and dirt due to their texture and porous nature. Uh, and dust and dirt is dif disfiguring. It attracts pests. Uh, dust and dirt can also damage baskets physically and chemically. Um, and gritty particles, uh, dust has gr is sometimes gritty particles and have sharp edges that may abrade baskets. Uh, dust and other solid particles attract and absorb materials from the atmosphere as well. And moisture can initiate harmful chemical reactions. And so you see there's a picture on the right hand side. That's actually my hand <laughs> um, after touching a, uh, a basket, thankfully that was in plastic, that happened to be near a vent that was spewing some black particulate matter. Um, and so we want to make sure to remove that um, if that happens to your collection. So before we vacuum, a lot of times what we suggest is people do, this is a good time to do condition reports. Um, you want to familiar, this helps you familiarize yourself with the potential vulnerabilities, including broken and unstable areas. Um, and you want to know this before you start vacuuming so you could take uh, greater care. Um, and so, uh, there's this, most of you probably know the sort of the standard condition reports, um, but more and more we're doing um, sort of these annotated condition reports using an image. And this is um, a lot, sometimes a lot easier and um, a lot quicker. So we are doing this more and more as well as doing the longer condition reports. And this is the sort of report that we might do if we're not doing a treatment. Um, we might do this if we're just doing a vacuum, just so we have an idea of some of the issues that might be, um, might, uh, be an issue when we're vacuuming. So there's lots of different vacuums. Um, a vacuum cleaner, you wanna have a vacuum cleaner with a high efficiency particulate air filter. So a HEPA, if you ever hear people talking about HEPAs, that's what it stands for, high efficiency particulate air filter. Um, and so those are recommended. And this is because a HEPA filter will, uh, will release less dust in the air than a traditional vacuum. So a, a HEPA filter can remove uh, about 99% of particles. Um, all tradi traditional vacuums will actually uh, ex exhaust, I mean, all vacuum cleaners blow out or exhaust the air they suck in. So sometimes um, you wanna be, you want the HEPA filters um, because of, there's a possibility that the object may contain mold or soot or insect egg, eggs and pesticides. And if you're releasing that into your collection environment or even your lab, this is not good for your, for your objects. So it's also best to purchase a vacuum cleaner with a variable suction in order to control the amount of suction. Um, and so some people you might see, uh, if you have a vacuum cleaner, it will have a dial. And so that's what a variable suction uh, control is. 
some people have vacuums that might have a nozzle that has a little like hole or a little um, door that uh, moves in and out. And that is what helps you um, control the amount of suction. Um, I've even seen some people drill holes in the plastic tube or the wand um, to help them again to lessen these, the suction on the, on the vacuum. Mini attachments may also be useful and can be used with full-size vacuum cleaners in the same way that uh, regular attachments are. We also, um, at the Arizona State Museum, uh, we also use a dental vac, and these are considered wet vacuums, um, and that doesn't mean that it's, you know, you're using water on the object. It just means water is used to create the suction and the dust is going into the water. And these are um, sort of old pieces of equipment. I actually buy ours on eBay and I looked recently, I, have, I don't see one, but they're usually only about $300. And one of the reasons why we really like these is because you could put really small attachments and um, they're really good for cleaning um, small like objects smaller objects or objects that you need a smaller attachment um, the suction is really low and we really enjoy this one of the reasons why we also really like our dental vacuum is because when you're done vacuuming all the dirt is in the water and you can actually visibly see the dirt in there and that's kind of refreshing to know that you're actually doing something <laughs> many times we like vacuum and sometimes you don't notice a change on the object but um but this way with the dental vacuum it's sort of like Oh, look, we did actually do something. So there's um, lots of different brushes that you can use. In general, you just want to have a clean, soft bristle brush. Um, this, uh, so sometimes people say, oh, if, the br if you brush, uh, take the brush and put it on your hand and it's um, the back of your hand, if it feels very soft, it's probably an okay um, brush to use. We really like uh, fan brushes because they help us do this flicking action, which is what we want into the vacuum nozzle. Um, so we use all different sizes of those. Also, the Japanese hake brushes are really good, or maybe like these kind of like fluffy cosmetic brushes are also really nice. You can also use um, the micro attachment that some uh, vacuums like the Nilfisk will come with, and you can also buy them separately. Um, but these, the brushes on those tend to be a little harder. So I would suggest uh, not, you wanna be careful when using these brushes, you wanna use those brushes on a more hardy basket. So other tools that you may want to use um, are turntables. We love these. They're um, a perfect way to put your basket on the turntable. And instead of moving the basket and braiding the bottom, you are moving the turntable. If you don't have a turntable, a lot of times we suggest people just to use a piece of um, ethafoam and you use the ethafoam as a turntable. And this will stop you from accidentally dragging the basket on, it, on its surface because that could be really abrasive. We use sandbags. Um, pretty frequently we make our own you can see the one in the bottom left are like pajama material and the other one are denim those are all fine they're all handmade we made them ourselves you can of course buy them online as well um, but making them is pretty cheap and easy we like to use lights a lot of times um, when we're we're working on baskets um, and some of us even enjoy wearing headlamps um, because it's a focus light bamboo skewers are really good for um, for just maybe you see like a, a fly speck, they're usually little black dots on, on baskets and we'll use uh, bamboo skewers to pop those off. And bamboo skewers tend to be a softer wood, so usually don't uh, scratch or abrade the object, but not always, so you have to be careful. Um, and we're, uh, of course, masks. We wear uh, masks when we think something is really dusty or we're nervous about um, whether there might be mold there. Um, and so we just uh, make that decision as we're vacuuming whether we would use a mask. So um, the, the procedure basically is pretty simple for vacuuming. You wanna brush the surface of the basket to loosen the dust and then sweep it into the nozzle. And so the way I explain this a lot of time, it's the same way that you push dust into a dustpan. So you have, um, usually we have our 
uh, our dominant hand with the brush and our non-dominant hand with the uh, vacuum nozzle and you just sweep inside. And so you want to just uh, with the fan brushes, we do a flicking action. And so we don't use the, in most situations, not all situations, but a lot of times we we're not putting the vacuum nozzle up against the object itself. We're using the brush to take the dust off. Um, you want to make sure that you vacuum in a logical direction. Um, so a lot of times we'll use the basket finish um, to uh, figure out where we started, or maybe we'll use a specific design because you want to make sure you clean the entire basket and not just part of the basket and with a lot of baskets there's a lot of continuous design so you just want to make sure that you're you're dusting the whole thing um, and again we use that turntable to move the basket while dusting um, but that's only if you if you like that technique we we like it a lot and we suggest it to people so one thing I noticed that a lot of people don't realize is that you do need to wash your your brushes um, and to make sure um, you want to regularly clean your tools and brushes and attachments uh, to prevent transferring and embedding dirt. And so we might not do this between uh, every basket unless it's a really dirty or a really dirty collection, uh, but we'll do this at least uh, once a day. Um, and you don't want to use your dusting brushes for any other activities. You don't want to use it for, um, I don't know, painting or solvent cleaning. Just avoid doing that. Um, so to the way that we clean our brushes is uh, to rinse the brush with warm water to make sure the brush is point and make sure the brush is pointing downwards. Uh, you want to avoid getting the ferrule wet. The ferrule is the metal part. Um, that's the sort of the metal sleeve. And usually there's some adhesive there. And if you get that wet, um, if you continuously get that wet, it can uh, loosen up the bristles and then the, the brush is useless to you. Um, and of course, uh, painting brushes can be very expensive, and so we want to want to keep our brushes as long as we can. So after we rinse it, we put some soap in our hand, and we sort of like uh, we take the fan brush and move it back and forth, or the brush and move it back and forth until it's really soapy, and then you rinse the soap uh, rinse until it's the soap is removed, and then you want to dry the brush thoroughly. You never want to use a wash a wet. Uh, brush on a, on a basket. Um, so the way that we dry these is pointing the brush downward again. So you're, we're avoiding water getting into that ferrule. I did want to point out that basic vacuuming is a task that many volunteers and students with good handling skills can participate in. Um, you have to give them detailed instructions. You want to make them, of course, aware of the pesticide issue. And you want to, uh, when, when they first start vacuuming, you want to work next to them during the first few attempts, just to make sure that their handling skills are good and they're not um, being too aggressive. And a lot of times we have people practice on a non-accessioned object first, just so they get, um, you know, get a handle of it. Um, but we also sometimes start with, um, smaller or less complicated materials before they move on to more complicated materials. So a lot of times I have I avoid, um, uh, try not to have volunteers work with um, feathers, beads, or other attachments on baskets because they can easily uh, fall off and then get suctioned up. So another technique that we use um, is uh, using something called Velux. And Velux is a non-woven synthetic fabric. Um, it consists of a double, oh, that's more, probably more information you need, but basically it uh, has a polyurethane foam with a polyester uh, webbing and, and also has nylon fiber on top. So it's sold as a blanket or a mat for beads. And you can buy these things at like Amazon or craft stores. I see them at craft stores all the time uh, marketed as, as bead mats. Um, you want to cut a little piece into a square that fits your nozzle and secure the, um, the nozzle with a rubber band or a string. Um, it provides a soft filter to trap the dirt that you can put, um, and you can put the, the nozzle with the Velux directly on direct contact with the object. Um, you want to make sure you rotate the cloth as it gets dirty, and it might get dirty pretty quickly. Um, and we find that this is a really good technique for removing uh, dust that um, is a little more, not completely adhered, but a little more adhered than a regular vacuum would do. So this is a really great technique. Um, 
there's been some studies that uh, you don't want to wash Velux um, or reuse Velux. So unfortunately, uh, if you after you've cleaned um, a basket, you have to throw that little piece out. Um, so it's not incredibly sustainable, but um, but it is also a very good technique. But again, you want to make sure that this is a technique that's even necessary um, if the basket is if the basket cleans up fine with a, a dust, just a regular dusting, then you don't need to do this. This is for a little more cleaning. So um, for there's also something called soot sponges and they're composed of vulcanized natural rubble, rubber. And you can purchase soot sponges at museum suppliers. And, and also I think I've even seen them on Amazon they can be cut into like different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, and the picture on the right are actually dirty ones. <laughs> They're not clean ones. Um, and the way that you would use these are to, um, instead of rubbing, tamping. So basically repeatedly pressing the sm sponge in the same place um, to remove any surface dirt. And this is, uh, you don't wanna rub because um, the tamping, um, is better than rubbing or rolling the sponge because you, by rubbing, you can be causing some abrasion. So you, you wanna do this sort of tamping process. And I always tell people this is kind of, uh, to tr for this uh, particular technique, maybe try on an educational basket first to make sure that you have the technique down because um, you don't want to abrade the surface. And again, just like the Velux, you only wanna do use a soot sponge if it's, if it's really needed. Um, after you do this, uh, use the soot sponge, we also uh, usually do another pass with the vacuum again, because if any little pieces of the sponge get on the basket, uh, it can cause maybe, uh, it's just going to have little crumbs everywhere. So you want to, again, clean that, uh, do another dust vacuuming. And we always dust, I should mention, we don't just go straight away to the Velux or the soot sponge. We always dust first, no matter what we're thinking, because you never know like how um, maybe something looks like it's more of a compacted uh, surface grime, but when you uh, clean it with um, the vacuum, maybe it all comes up. So you just want to use the, the dusting first and then work your way up and make sure that you're not cleaning something just to do it. Um, you want to make sure that you're, you, there's a reason why you're cleaning it with these techniques. Um, you don't want to use this technique on archaeological baskets or damaged baskets, as you can cause a lot of abrasion and um, can cause breakage. So um, organic materials are um, susceptible to mold. Um, and this mold, mold can cause disfiguring uh, damage and weaken material. Um, objects that have had mold are, are, are more susceptible to getting mold in the future. So if you had an object that came in with mold um, and you clean that mold off, it may also get mold in the future. It's more susceptible than a basket that hasn't. Um, mold can be deterred by controlling the environment. So we would prefer there we don't have to clean mold. <laughs> um, so you want to maintain a relative humidity below 60% because at around 65% you're, um, you're in uh, risk of, of mold pretty easily. Um, you want to keep your storage areas clean and free of dust because mold uh, likes dust and likes uh, dirty baskets. Um, what, if you uh, are going to vacuum inactive mold, you want to wear protective equipment. Um, mold can be a really serious health hazard and you definitely want to use a vacuum with a, help, a HEPA filter if you are cleaning mold. Um, only inactive mold should be surface cleaned um, and inactive mold usually looks dry and powdery. Um, there was actually a really good resource. Conservators at the Field Museum did a nice talk at ATOM uh, two years ago, and I believe that's available through Sustainable Heritage. Uh, they have this really great flow chart about when, uh, what to do in, in case of a mold outbreak, what to do specifically with an individual basket. Um, and so this is a really good uh, resource to look at if you feel like you have some issues with mold. Um, there's also a really good National Park Service article about or conservagram uh, about mold that, that would be useful to you looking at. But anytime um, mold, uh, because mold is such a scary thing, um, uh, you might want to call a conservator. So there are many things you can do to care for your collection by yourself. 
Um, but however, sometimes you may need the advice um, or treatment from a professional. And so places that you can call the American Institute for Conservation has a find a conservator page that's really useful if you don't know of any conservators. Um, also, you can call uh, institutional conservators um, and they may be, able to, may be able to give you advice or they may be able to direct you to um, to someone that can help you or to a private conservator. So for instance, we work for the state or the state museum. And so we commonly get calls from the general public. And so I um, will give people guidance about uh, what, uh, whether they can uh, maybe do something or not do something, whether they should call a private conservator. Um, so yeah, feel, feel free to call me, um, whether you live in Arizona or not. And if I can help you, I will. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about our storage um, and some of the techniques that um, that we use um, to uh, care for our objects and store our objects. And so at ASM, most of our basketry is stored on open shelves on movable uh, shelving units. Uh, we also have um, a viewing window from the gallery into the vault. Um, most of our uh, baskets are on movable, movable unit shelving um, and they sit, most of the basketry on the movable units are sitting on shelves without dust covers. And that's, well, there's two reasons for that. One, because they're on shelves that have sort of a, a top, uh, they don't get as dusty. And so, and we want our objects to look pretty <laughs> in the windows, but also with consultation with tribal members and artists, uh, they actually prefer that we didn't put them in plastic if we didn't need to, because they prefer that the objects are, are breathing. So, but for some objects, um, some more sensitive objects that need more protection are stored in boxes and cabinets. And this provides an additional enclosure to protect them from changes in the environment. All of the perishable archaeological collections are stored in this manner, as, uh, as well as our miniature baskets. And that's because they need a little more protection. Um, and also, they tend to be a lot smaller, so it's much easier to keep track of them in these, in these cabinets. Uh, we like to line our boxes with Valera, which is a smoother polyethylene foam, and this prevents any abrasion occurring to these sensitive objects. So another way uh, that we have to store our objects is on movable racks. Um, even though we have a new storage area, um, of course, we are always fighting for new for space. We always are getting new collections and we need more space. And sometimes we need to use movable racks. So we have um, we actually just buy sort of metal racks from Uline with uh, casters and sometimes not. Um, and so here is sort of a uh, an image of some of our um, basketry on these movable racks um, that we we place in different areas in the in the storage. In some cases, we do use uh, dust covers, especially for baskets that are on top of um, sort on top of the cabinets. We have a lot of those, which you'll see. Um, and so, you want to use a polyethylene plastic bag. Um, either a cover or it may be completely closed. And to close it, you could use a cotton tool tape tie so it's easily, you can easily open it. Um, we use the heat sealers um, to, to make a better fit. Um, and these are available at places like Gaylord and probably on Amazon at this point. Um, some other, uh, you can also use muslin fabric um, with uh, covers either with Velcro or just on top of objects. Um, we also have seen people use Tyvek as well. Um, and so there's lots of different ways to, to make dust covers. Um, we also, for some objects, uh, we need to use Tyvek, like a Tyvek barrier. And this is Tyvek as the text, like there's a Tyvek paper and there's a Tyvek textile. And so this is the Tyvek textile. And so for resin-based materials, like we have a bunch, we have over a hundred pine pitch baskets in our collection. And um, if it ever got too moist in our collection area, these can become kind of sticky. And so the Tyvek barrier helps us if that, unfortunately, if that does happen, which hopefully it never does, um, they won't be, they won't get attached to anything. This Tyvek will help with that. Uh, we also put it as a layer between ethafoam because it's a lot smoother, um, a smoother surface than the ethafoam. Or if in some situations we still do need to stack our baskets, sometimes we'll, we'll put a layer of Tyvek between the two so they don't get kind of stuck together. 
Um, another thing that we do um, is use uh, these supports. So this support is designed to uh, support a weak or damaged base. And it basically, um, it immobilizes the base to prevent any further damage. Um, and it also provides a base to hold for moving the object. So you're not holding it by any of the areas that are really unstable. And it's a very simple mount, which just consists of an acid-free corrugated board cut larger than the base. And then we put slits in for four, six or eight evenly spaced slits into the board um, and then lace in some cotton twill and that's sort of tied at the top. So it's very a very basic um, uh, support and very easy to make for most people are able to make these pretty easily. Um, another type of support that we use are internal supports, and there's lots of ways to make internal supports, but this is one that we use, um, that we do use, that's very easy for people to make. And basically what we do is take a plastic bag. You want to make sure that you have, you put the, pe the peanuts in plastic bag, so a polyethylene bag, and you, we put po uh, polystyrene peanuts inside. And so how, the way we do that is we just put the plastic bag in the basket and then put the polystyrene bag um, peanuts in until we get a little bit more of a shape um, for the basket that's, that's not too big. Um, and then we close it off, which we'll tape. You don't wanna put the polystyrene uh, peanuts directly in contact with the basket because you can um, have some issues with that, with sticking um, with some, some collections, um, but the, the plastic bag works well. There's other ways to do this, to do these internal supports, but this is one of the easier ones that we do. So you wanna be careful not to overstuff or stuff. Usually people, there's tissue paper, but sometimes tissue paper gets stuck on the basketry fibers. So we tell people not to use that. Um, also, you don't wanna do this on something that's really um, a basket that has uh, a lot of structural issues like this one here. Um, we also have a lot of bat, we have over, Oh, I think 50 basketry hats in our collection. And this was a really big um, issue for us because basket hats are quite um, big and take up a lot of space. Um, but we came up with, or not us, Susie Moreno, um, who is a conservator here at ASM, uh, worked out a really wonderful way to stack our hats without creating too much space. And so the way she did that is she took acid-free corrugated board and made a hole in the center to fit over the crown of a, of a hat. And then she used polyethylene foam blocks adhered to the board for corner supports. Um, and then as you can see, the baskets can sit on top of each other as long as the, the crown isn't bigger than the next hat above it. And so this is how uh, she stacked them. Oop, let me go back one. Um, and then we actually ended up uh, after we did the stack, we would put the polyethylene bags around the stack to prevent dust and also to prevent movement. So they were all kind of together in one little bag. For fragile hats uh, we, that require special handling, um, we, used, uh, we stored in boxes. And the support can be made to fit inside the crown to prevent movement. And this can be made by a Tyvek pillow or um, maybe foam. Um, and so you want to make sure it's smaller again than the internal size of the uh, the crown of the hat. Um, and then what uh, what we did a lot of times because most of these fragile hats have uh, things like um, feathers or other things that we don't want to handle uh, too much. We added little or she added um, little uh, cotton tool tape handle so you're able to lift the hat without touching the hat. Um, this way people can still look at it um, uh, and do research. Um, another uh, technique that we use, um, this method is really preferred for large burden baskets and large baskets with the form bases. And this is a more complicated storage mount made primarily from acid-free corrugated board. Um, these, you can find these directions in an older article um, called Storage Supports for, for a Basket Collection. And there's other really uh, great um, storage supports in that article. Um, but this is uh, for our burden baskets. We have a ton, or not a ton, we have a lot of California burden baskets and this is really the best way to store them um, because the we don't wanna store them on their rim um, so this way with this type of rehousing mount, um, you can actually store it by 
upright on its base. And it does take up a lot of room, but it's the best way to store these. Another uh, way that we store our objects is through, uh, I mentioned already, um, sort of movable racks. Um, but this is a vertical storage rack for plaque baskets. We have, a, we have over 300 plaque baskets. All Most of them are Hopi. Um, and they're usually flat baskets or uh, usually coiled or wicker baskets that actually can be stored upright. So Nancy had the original idea of she was thinking of records and how records are stored. And Krista Pack, who worked on uh, the project, came up with this, uh, this whole system. And you can actually find the instructions for this. Um, on the stash website for AIC. And you actually, you could just Google vertical storage rack for plaque baskets. But basically what she did is she made these boxes that fit the racks. Um, and then in the boxes, they're separated by uh, corrugate, again, with the archival corrugated board. At the bottom, there's um, a piece of polyethylene foam and to support the basket so we're not, um, so the basket is sitting on like a plush uh, pillow. She made Tyvek pillows with polyester fiber fill. Um, and this way uh, you don't have any issues with rim, the rim deforming or the rim breaking. And we only do this with uh, plaques that are in good shape. You don't wanna do this with plaques that um, have a lot of, uh, they're un unstable or have issues. Another thing that we do in our collection is actually hanging storage. Um, and this uh, may be something that might be useful for you because again, we're, everyone is always running out of space. And so you just keep going up. <laughs> so you can see on the left that we do have um, baskets that are stored on top of um, on top of cabinets. And originally we did them without plastic. And then over time we decided or over a few months, we decided that those actually did need um, plastic bags or dust covers. Um, but the ones on the top, there are a bunch of uh, burden baskets on the left-hand side. They kind of look like jellyfish to me. <laughs> um, but we had our FM, our facilities management department, put up these two um, metal bars. And so those two metal bars actually hold um, hold a human. He actually did a little push up on it to make sure it worked because a lot of baskets will actually weigh a lot. So you have to uh, consider weight issues and also fire suppression issues. So you wanna make sure they're below your fire suppression. Um, but the way we did this, this is basically took twill tape um, and made sort of a, um, a crossed tie and tied the baskets, uh, tied them at the top um, and then put uh, added um, a plastic bag. So there's a plastic bag sort of the spoked um, cotton twill and then tied at the top. And then all of that is tied to sort of uh, like a seat clip. And those are um, then attached to uh, the, uh, the bars at the top. And on the right-hand side, those are other burden baskets. Those are kiahas or gihos from the tonatum uh, um, or piman. And uh, those ones, again, are a very similar um, way of hanging them as well, but you had to use actually both the bars when we're doing that. Um, and we're really lucky that our collection has um, a fair amount of these uh, burden baskets um, and all of them are complete because if you go to other collections like at the Smithsonian um, and uh, maybe a lot of other East Coast museums, they ended up uh, removing a lot of the bars. And so they're flat and so they store them flat. So we don't wanna store them flat. We don't wanna take them apart. So we do this uh, hanging technique. Again, there's other, we um, have hung <clears throat> other sort of flat plaque baskets that are really, really big. This is a really big Hopi plaque basket. And so we hung, we hung this up uh, using a technique I'll talk about in a second, but, um, because this basket is particularly vulnerable to light, we covered it with some black Tyvek. Um, <clears throat> and then we put a, a, a photo so everyone knows what's, what's there and they don't think it's just some of a piece of black, um, black Tyvek hanging on the wall for no reason. So I'll quickly go, sorry, take, hopefully I'm not going too over. Um, 
talk to you quickly about our mounts, what type of mounts we use. Um, so when you use mounts, uh, you wanna make sure that the uh, basket is completely supported. Some way, ways to do that is sometimes the easiest thing is just to put them on a pedestal or put them on a flat surface, but sometimes uh, you want to see the design, so you want to hold them vertically. And so we're really lucky. We have a really great uh, exhibit, uh, a mount maker that helps us do that. So he makes uh, brass mounts and metal mounts for us, and you can kind of see how those are made in these images. Um, but not everyone has um, a mount maker. Um, and so this is a technique that, again, Nancy Odegaard, who's uh, emeritus here at ASM, um, came up with this spider mount. And so the way we do this is we use coated wire. So that could be black, uh, brown, black, or tan. Um, and we use colors that are kind of similar to the basket. Uh, cotton twill tape, uh, wire cutters, and or uh, pliers, or ran a round mandrel pliers. Whatever you have, pliers work well too, but sometimes the round ones work better. So what we do, I don't know, is we um, take the wire and cut them into little pieces and curl them um, on one side for the cotton tool tape and sort of round them on the other side to hold the basket. And then we put them in place. We usually put five or six, maybe more if it's a really large basket, uh, but you wanna put them throughout the entire basket. And then you take the twill tape and you lace it through the, the wire and then you uh, knot it at the top. And when you hang them, you hang them from the, the twill tape. And you can make a little, if you wanna um, hang them a little lower, you can actually make a knot on one side so it hangs from the knot instead of the, um, the circle of the twill tape. But this is a really easy technique and uh, you can use it for all sizes of baskets. You just wanna use different, different spokes. And this is, um, there's actually a really good, oops, I'll just go back. There's a really good, um, uh, well, Nancy. Nancy did a video of how to do this through the Sustainable Heritage website. So um, we, I can, that's available there uh, to look at further instructions. So the last thing I just wanted to uh, mention is that we do, for labeling our objects, we do a laser printed paper label. And uh, again, we've done several online webinars and tutorials that can be find, found through Connecting to Collections. I just did one two months ago on a tutorial for paper-based labeling. Uh, and then Nancy and me did one um, a few years ago for ATOM, which is also available through the Sustainable Heritage website. Um, that you can look for. But basically what we do is we use Roplex um, and we use paper, uh, printed paper labels and we use the Roplex to adhere the label to the basket or to the object. And this is a technique that was invented here at ASM. Um, and, but like I said, there's several tutorials um, online that you can find uh, where we explain how to do this. So, um, that's the end of my talk. And, but I did wanna give uh, credit to Nancy, who's obviously taught me a lot of this information and who uh, wrote the grant for this big project that we worked for. And uh, I also listed some of the people that are in the photos and also supplied me with photos uh, for this talk. So thank you. Thank you, Gina. We have some questions in the Q and A. Great. And uh, I'll go through as many as we can. Um, in the beginning, when we were talking about pesticides, we you mentioned your portable XRF. If somebody wants to be sure, wants to have that assurance and get their items tested for pesticides, is there somewhere they could send that out to? Yeah, so there are conservators and conservation scientists that you can contact that own their own equipment and will go out. Um, if you're a tribal museum, like so we work with uh, a lot of the museums um, in Arizona, a lot of the tribal museums and the uh, uh, tribal members, um, and so we will help help them with uh, identifying pesticides. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to um, uh, there are people that you can contact specifically that do that, um, but you'd have to pay them, of course. Um, but there are some, if you, um, especially if you're wanting to do your whole collection instead of one object, one object maybe like you could come here, but if it's a whole collection, you'd probably have to find a private person. And I can actually, if 
you send me your email, I, I think I know of some people I can recommend, uh, just not at the, top, at, the, at the top of my head. <laughs> Would you recommend a regular cleaning plan for your baskets? Is something, as an example, maybe every two years or something like that, or just as needed and prior to use? Yeah, you know, I would actually recommend that people create a housekeeping plan for the collection space first um, before you maybe do an overall of your collection. Um, so you want to make sure uh, you don't want to be putting baskets into a storage space that's not regular, regularly clean because you're just uh, getting more dust on your objects. I would say it really kind of depends on your collection. Um, uh, whether you decide to do, um, uh, we have, like I said, we have 5,000 baskets. So for us to do a uh, cleaning of those baskets every two years would be a huge undertaking. Um, but I would say you might wanna just make an assessment. So I would say do it, clean your, the collection space regularly. Uh, maybe that's every year or every six months and then do spot, uh, spot checks of the baskets. So are your baskets, do they look dusty? I wouldn't vacuum thing, things just to vacuum them because you could be abrading, like abrading those collections. Um, so hopefully that answered it. Do you recommend that pesticide contaminated baskets not be vacuumed at all, even with a HEPA filter or just make sure we're using a fume hood? asking because this specific storage space slash lab doubles as a workspace and the questioner is at concerned about safety. Oh, okay, let me see. Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, we, I guess it would depend on um, your space. I think vacuuming, vacuum, vacuuming baskets that are collections that have pesticides are okay as long as you're using the the correct equipment um, including having using your own PPE or you making sure you have a HEPA filter um, especially if your object if you're coming if objects are coming in and they're dusty I don't want you to like avoid dusting dusty baskets because they might have pesticides on them um, so I don't know if I answered that completely completely, but um, I, I would say it's okay to, to vacuum them. You just wanna make sure that you're, you're protecting yourself and protecting the baskets, if that makes sense. And if you want to, I should say, if anyone had specific questions about pesticides, there's that book that I mentioned in the beginning that Nancy wrote. Um, and so she's really well known for her research on pesticide and really is the expert. And she's um, very, uh, a, like a great person to talk to about like very specific questions about pesticides and she's retired although very busy but also loves to talk about uh, lo loves to talk to people and, and is a really friendly person um but if you uh yeah and you can also send specific questions to me as well if that that's helpful <laughs> and with regard to that book and a few of the other resources that have been mentioned today gina did prepare a handout that i'll email out to everyone who uh registered and or attended this morning. So you'll have the name of that book right there. Uh, continuing with some of the questions, uh, we have a basket that was charred. In order to reduce burnt dust from falling off, we have it wrapped in plastic. Is it safe to leave charred wood in plastic or could this possibly exasperate or cause mold to form because it's not able to breathe? I think you're okay if you don't have mold, if, if it's, if it's dry uh, and you're and you have a good environment, it's okay to put it in the basket. I think that's all right. We have a question that there has been some debate at this person's institution regarding the best environment for baskets. What is uh, your recommendation for RH and temperature? Oh, so that that I knew I was going to get this question, <laughs> and it is. It's really like the the correct. Uh, sort of standard environment numbers is highly debated, but my suggestion is that it, well, it's not really a suggestion, it's to tell you that it's, it really depends. And more and more conservators are not using um, specific numbers. So like, I think when I started 
going to school, they, they would say 50% relative humidity, 68 degrees. Well, that's not possible in, in many areas. It is not possible for our museum to maintain those. That's a very much East Coast environment that you can maintain. So for instance, here, um, if we maintained what well, we would our, we would never be able to maintain a 50% humidity. But if we did, we would probably end up getting mold because we have monsoons. And uh, if there was an issue with our HVAC system during a monsoon and we had 50% relative humidity, um, it could easily get up to the 65 and risk of mold um, pretty quickly. So here at ASM, we... Um, currently have, uh, so I guess what I should say is you wanna avoid, the most important thing is you don't wanna get really high humidity or high temperature. Um, so ab above 65% for baskets, cause then you're gonna get mold. Um, and the most important thing for baskets is fluctuations. So you don't wanna have um, major fluctuations. So here in Tucson, um, we have, it's very, very dry and very, very hot, but we get these monsoons. And so um, we want to make sure that we don't, aren't 10% humidity. Well, our collections aren't that bad, but 10% humidity one day and 40% the next, which is a complete, that can happen here. It's crazy. So we have to, we're guided by what our HVAC systems can handle. So I don't really give out a uh, specific environmental numbers for people, especially if your collections are, um, uh, so our collections are separated by materials. So that works to our, our benefit, but some museums don't have that ability and you have one collection space for all your types of objects. So that's one issue. But here at ASM, we tend to keep our, um, and this, I'm not saying that this should be for you, <laughs> but we, uh, we keep our um, basketry vault at, um, about 38 to 40% humidity, so very low, um, because that's what we can maintain, and about 70 degrees. Um, and so, but that's because um, that's what our, our, that's what we can maintain at that stable rate. There's a really good articles um, or resource at um, the Imaging Permanence Institute, and I didn't add that to the resource page, but maybe I should, because um, they go into this uh, sort of the, um, the issues with giving out standards, um, because really what you have to do is you have to know what you can handle, what your system can handle. And you, yeah, you just want to make sure you have that stable, sorry, this is more longer than it probably should have been, but that you want to have a stable environment and you want to make sure you can maintain that stable environment. And if you're in a weird place like Tucson, that can be very difficult. <laughs> sorry, too much. <laughs> well, we'll have to add the IPI uh, paper to the yeah yeah handout. Um, hopefully, a, a shorter answer. What type of soap do you use to wash the brushes? Oh, uh, we just use like Dawn, <laughs> just regular uh, dish soap. Are you ever worried about condensation with the use of polyethylene bags? Not, not at our institution. We're not. Um, if you have issues with um, relative humidity, like getting really moist, you might worry a little more about that um but here in tucson we're we're less you know we have like a re relative humidity outside of 10 percent most of the most of the day <laughs> but also if you are so uh you know if you're putting something in a plastic bag when it's really humid that day that's not a that's not a good thing because <laughs> you're making a little microclimate on the inside of the plastic basket the plastic bag and that's sometimes why we do covers too, right? So there's some airflow um, instead of completely containing something. Do you have any specific recommendations for preparing and packing baskets for offsite warehouse storage? Oh, so how to bring, how to travel with them? Is that the question? Like how to? Uh, I'm guessing the question is with reference to the differences for an on-site and off-site. So yeah, the travel and maybe being able to check on it less often. Okay, so we, that's a good question. Um, so uh, if we were moving an object from one facility to the other, um, depending on if that facility was ours or not, 
So if it was coming here, we would actually do a freezing process just to make sure that something isn't infested. Um, that's how we deal with our sort of our preventative for getting for insects. Um, and also we might not take that object out um, the same day we might let it like acclimatize in the box um, is one way that we might deal with like moving areas. I would also maybe say don't move collections on a really humid day or really hot day, really hot and humid day. We actually, um, we have actually two buildings that we, we have collections and then we do move it across, but we make sure not to do, it's not raining. <laughs> um, it's not really humid that day because you can get um, mold. And we actually had that happen. We brought uh, a basket from one storage area to, the, to another and it was in a box and it, it somehow got mold on the way over. Um, and so you just wanna make sure not to do that when it's sort of a, a bad humid day outside or um, it's raining or something like that. Any recommendations for that transport though with the type of oh, thing? What type of, oh, okay. So we do pretty limited stuff um, and it kind of, again, depend. like we're a lot of times we're just going across the street, but if you're traveling, we just use um, uh, even a non-archival box because you don't always need an archival box. We just use like a, a cardboard box. Um, we usually put, um, loosely put on a plastic bag so we don't always tie it. Um, but we put a plastic bag because that helps with, um, so you don't getting a lot of snagging when you're putting something in the uh, box. And then sometimes we'll put, uh, sort of do a cap, like a gigantic cavity cut um, out of foam. And that doesn't have to, be, if it's only a short period of time of travel, we don't use archival, archival foam necessarily because um, you don't really need it because it's going to go in and out. And as long as you, you have that polyethylene um, bag on the outside, that'll help protect it. Uh, we have a question about the coated wire used for the spider mounts, which also got a number of comments on how cool those were. Uh, what is the wire coated with? Uh, you can get them in polyethylene or polypropylene coated wire. If mold is active, how would you make it inactive without reducing the RH too much so as to prevent drying uh, or drying out organic components in the basket? How would you? Um, I might ask you to call to call a conservator specifically on that question. I mean, I know I'm I'm a conservator, but I think if you have it kind of is really dependent on the materials you have um, and how you would do that. How would you go about doing that? I would say anytime you see active mold that I would just immediately call a conservator. And actually, if I see if I see mold, I always run it by other conservators because it can get really tricky and uh, really fast. You just don't want that to come to continue to grow and um, sort of get on other collections, right? Uh we have a question here. What should we do if a basket gets wet? For instance, their museum is situated near a large river that sometimes floods. Oh my God. <laughs> um, yeah, I, again, I would probably call, call a conservator for your specific things. And I'll say, I actually personally don't have a lot. I uh, haven't had a lot um, to do with active mold because of where I'm at. <laughs> So there might be, um, and like I said, there was um, a really good resource or online um, webinar, or wasn't online, it was in person, um, it's on Sustainable Heritage uh, website, and the field conservators from the Field Museum did this really great flow chart about what you should do um, in different situations when you're dealing with uh, wet objects and mold. And so that's a really good separate resource that you should probably, that people should look at. So there are a few more questions. I apologize that we're running out low on time, but there's one more here. We, we briefly mentioned uh, a little bit about this, but I thought I would uh, close with this one where there's a California basket maker talking about how she washes her baskets every few months as a way to care for them. And she's curious if your lab has ever implemented any kinds of these traditional care processes that may seem at odds with how museum professionals think of conservation. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion about this in our field right now about what's 
um, what's appropriate and what's um, what uh, just 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 this uh, issue not it's not an issue but what about this in general about how to do traditional techniques um, and so we uh, we don't do it ourselves like I wouldn't do a traditional technique because I'm not I'm not an indigenous person I'm not a native person um, but there are some things that uh, that will do um, because it's recommended to us uh, by, by tribal people. And um, there's some really good, um, right now the AIC uh, conference is happening right now and there's a bunch of discussions about this uh, right now. So I'm, I'm still learning about this myself, about what, what we should do and um, what to do, but we, uh, here at ASM, when someone wants to come in and do um, feeding or um, uh, you know use uh, sage or something like that, we will will make that will make that happen. <laughs> so not much of an answer, but <laughs> well, I apologize that there's a few other uh, questions that we didn't get to, but. I do want to share about our next webinar, if I can find my slide. I hope everyone can see my slide. <laughs> um, so thank you again, Gina, and thank you to everyone for asking so many amazing questions. I will put mine and Gina's contact information back up here on the screen in just a second. So if those other few questions we didn't get to are pressing, you can reach out to us in that manner. Uh, our next uh, webinar will be on Thursday, June 17th, also at 10 a.m. Pacific. And we have Francis Lukasik, who is uh, a new conservator with the Naval History and Heritage Command, which is actually uh, who I work for uh, out here at the U.S. Naval Undersea Museum in Washington. And she's going to be talking uh, about working with and handling corroded metal objects. So. We have a lot of salt water contaminated metal objects. So that will be a lot of fun for many of us that have those types of collections. The registration for that is now open and you can go to rcwr.org and go to the workshops tab and you'll have information about that upcoming event as well as as soon as we get the YouTube video posted and embedded video from today and all of the other webinars we've hosted so far. Once again, I have mine and Gina's contact information up here on the screen. If you have questions about RCWR generally, this webinar series or a suggestion on a topic we haven't covered yet that you'd love to see covered, please do reach out to me. As Gina mentioned, she's happy to receive questions from collections managers. There's a few that we didn't get to today, but I'm sure we all have many more over our careers. So uh, it's good to have each other as resources and know who we can reach out to. But thank you again, Gina. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope it's been as informative for everybody else as it has been for me. And we look forward to seeing you all in June. And check your email later today for that handout that has been promised.